Writers in Shakespeare's day weren't very worried about plagiarism. In fact, Shakespeare took the plots and characters of nearly all his plays from existing works, adding his own flair. The story of Romeo and Juliet goes back hundreds of years, right back to ancient authors like Ovid and Xenophon, and more recently, 14th century Italian novellas. Shakespeare was inspired by Arthur Brooke's English translation of one of these Italian versions, but changed a lot to make it more interesting. He shortened the plot's time frame to make the action more intense, and he made characters like Mercutio and Lord Capulet more complex. The finished product has been one of Shakespeare's most popular plays. To understand the play, it's important to understand how Shakespeare engages with genre. Remember, genre is a general category of literature, like science fiction, horror, action, romance. Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy, but with a healthy dose of Elizabethan comedy along the way. Let's look at the comedic aspects first. Shakespeare had written a few successful comedies before Romeo and Juliet, and we can see this light-hearted tone in Romeo and Juliet as well. There are plenty of jokes. Be on the lookout for all the fun wordplay, like in the opening scene where two Capulets make puns about their jobs and the conflict with the Montagues, throwing in plenty of sexual innuendo for good measure. Also, Elizabethan comedies often revolved around themes like romance and misunderstanding. But Shakespeare didn't just write a shallow, funny love story. He engaged with the concept of love on a much deeper level than the comedies that his audience was used to. For example, a lot of portrayals of love at the time were inspired by love poems by an Italian dude named Petrarch. These popular poems demonstrated the concept of courtly love where men would dramatically declare their love for women from afar, often with extravagant and flowery language. Remember Romeo at the beginning of the play? He is totally obsessed with Rosaline. His language is over the top and flowery, just like Petrarch's poems. But Shakespeare dismisses this form of love as ultimately shallow. When Romeo meets Juliet, it's different. He experiences a deep spiritual connection with her rather than pining after her from a distance and spouting lots of exaggerated poems. Romeo has found genuine love, more authentic than the courtly love shown in Petrarchan style poetry. Another example of how Romeo and Juliet is deeper than traditional rom coms is the ending. Spoiler alert! Romeo and Juliet both die. What? This never happens in traditional comedies. The deaths in the play reflect Shakespeare's move towards writing more tragic material. It's still lighter than the heavier plays like Hamlet, Othello and King Lear, but plenty of characters still die and the ending is terribly sad. You might be wondering why Shakespeare was so obsessed with death. Well, he and much of his Elizabethan audience had experienced close encounters with death. In 1592, three years before Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, a massive plague had struck London. Some historians believe over 10% of the population was killed. Of course, the plague forced everyone to think deeply about the reality of mortality. One reason why Shakespeare decided to incorporate more death into his plays. Life isn't always a happy comedy. Now, let's examine the political context. Shakespeare sets his play in 14th century Italy, which was similar in lots of ways to his time in 16th century England when Queen Elizabeth I ruled. Both times had experienced a lot of violence and political uncertainty. For example, in Italy, there was a famous rivalry between the Capaletti and Montecchi families. If you think these names sound a lot like Capulet and Montague, you'd be right. This conflict inspired older versions of Romeo and Juliet that appeared in Italian literature. In Shakespeare's day, 
his audience would have been reminded of conflicts between powerful families in England, like a fight between the Stuart and Tudor families. The Tudor family had ruled England for a long time. In fact, Queen Elizabeth was the last Tudor monarch. But the Stuart family, who ruled Scotland, were a bit of a threat to Tudor power. The Queen had even executed her own cousin, Mary Stuart, who threatened Elizabeth's throne. Thus, the tragic Capulet-Montague rivalry in Romeo and Juliet can be understood as a warning to those in power. Shakespeare is saying, watch out for family feuds. They can have disastrous consequences and ruin peace and stability for everyone else. Next, think about the influence of religion on the play. Elizabethan England was predominantly Christian, so everyone believed that God was in control. But Shakespeare was also writing in the time of the Renaissance, when a lot of ancient art and texts had been rediscovered. These new ideas had a big influence on people's understandings of God and the world. For example, Queen Elizabeth herself had just translated into English an old Latin text by Boethius called The Consolation of Philosophy. One of the big ideas in Boethius's text is that the world is controlled by God and fortune. Fortune, or luck, is God's agent in the nitty-gritty details of life. Even if luck doesn't seem to make much sense, ultimately, all the details will work themselves out and order will be restored. That's why fortune is such a big theme in Romeo and Juliet. Think about all the terrible coincidences in Juliet's tomb. Everyone arrives or departs at just the wrong moment, leading to the lover's deaths. But in the end, this string of bad luck leads to the end of the family conflict. Order is restored. Finally, what about Elizabethan views on gender, marriage and family? We'll be brief here because you can learn more about this in our lesson on gender in Romeo and Juliet. But it's important to remember that Elizabethans saw marriage and family as the foundational building blocks of society. And order had to be maintained within the family unit to ensure order on a societal level. Remember that Shakespeare's society was patriarchal, which meant that men had all the power and women were expected to be quiet and subservient. So in a family unit, the male head of the family was in control and the women had no say. Their only purpose in life was to become dutiful wives and mothers. That's why Capulet expects Juliet to obey him when he tells her to marry Paris and why he is so shocked when she disobeys. This makes Juliet a pretty rebellious and strong character. Shakespeare uses her to challenge the dominant patriarchal framework of the family. Perhaps audiences would be reminded of Queen Elizabeth, another powerful woman who refused to marry. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on Romeo and Juliet, check out our explanation of the play's plot summary.